1950s, this was an extraordinary time in travel. Our country was in the middle of this post-war expansion. Our industry was growing. Aircraft, like the DC-3 and other innovations, were enabling airlines to carry more people, more profitably, and more safely than ever before. But, but, there was a problem. Airlines couldn't keep up with the growth. They were managing this rising mountain of reservations and seat availability with paper ledgers and index cards. Now, for those of you who've managed a growing business without technology, I think you have a sense of what they were going through. Now, there was one airline, American Airlines, under their CEO at the time, C.R. Smith. They could see what was coming, and they began investing in ways to automate this challenge, going all the way back to the early 1940s. Now, the first big advancement, I guess you could call it that, was this contraption of switches and wires and relays. They called it the brain. A couple of years later, 1952, they introduced the next step, the magnetronic reservoir. I know what you're all thinking. As soon as you saw that photo, yes, that must be a magnetronic reservoir. But still, it was not enough, especially as airlines entered into the jet age. Now, it just so happened in 1953, C.R. Smith, he found himself on one of his flights sitting next to somebody who worked for IBM. They began chatting, and out of that conversation, we have the seeds of the very first computerized reservation system for airlines. What did they call it? The semi-automatic business research environment. Thankfully, they decided to refer to it simply as Saber. Now, it was almost 10 years before Saber eventually came online. That was the early 1960s. It does make me wonder, though, you know, when did tours or activities or attractions, when, when did we get our first reservation system? Interesting. So once the system came online, the effects were, were almost immediate. American Airlines was able to handle upwards of 80,000 phone calls a day, process at a peak of more than 20,000 tickets a day. This was simply unprecedented for airlines at the time. They could do it with a degree of reliability and accuracy that no other airline could match. So not surprisingly, the carrier quickly gained market share, especially against its arch rival, United. Now, this is one of these kind of fabled uh, you know, stories uh, within technology and within aviation. It speaks to the possibility of technology to transform an industry, to create an entirely new playing field. This innovation made American Airlines better, and it made travel better for its customers. Now, us, kind of here, 70 years later, our industry, tours, activities, attractions, events, experiences, all of the things that travelers do in destination, we're actually going through the same thing. The specifics are different. It's not one company driving innovation. There are literally hundreds of companies that are investing in technology and trying to automate our industry and carry us forward. The specifics, indeed, are different, but they're happening for very much the same reasons. This is a huge industry. We are the third largest sector in travel after transportation and accommodation. We're growing very fast. We are comprised of hundreds of distinct industries or industry kind of subsets and different business types. This represents upwards of a million businesses and entrepreneurs around the world. And many, if not most, are offline. They're not connected. And we can see this reflected in booking trends. Most of the rest of travel is booked online. But our part, 
we like to call it the best part, because it is the best part, still has some ways to go. Now, the next big step for Sabre, because they weren't done. Once they had automated reservations for one airline, they set their sights on the entire industry. So they began this process of connecting hundreds of airlines to hundreds of thousands of travel agencies around the world. This was not easy. It did not happen overnight. It did not happen without controversy. Many of those controversies are still very much alive today. Many of those controversies are very similar to some of the controversies in this industry and some of the debates that we will have on this stage. But one thing that history has borne out, those airlines, those travel agencies that didn't pay attention, that were a little slow to move, or that resisted, they quickly found themselves falling behind. This evolution of Sabre from a reservation system to like global distribution, it was an extraordinary development. Today, we all take it for granted. I mean, any of us now, we can go to a thousand different websites and we can see an almost unlimited set of options on where we can go and prices and so forth. It's really extraordinary. And this, this is also happening in our industry right now. It's amazing. Those same companies, hundreds of companies that are trying to automate our industry are trying to connect it to this world, this growing world of distribution and online travel agencies. We just updated our directory of digital distributors for this marketplace. We identified upwards of 120 companies that are focused on selling tours, activities, attractions, events, and experiences online. So if some of what I'm talking about, if it seems a little unfamiliar, if it makes you wonder about the state of our industry, where we're headed, what does it mean for all of us, for you, for your businesses, it's OK. It's actually more than OK. That's why we're here. That's why we devote so much of our program to understanding trends and technology and distribution and what's happening and what's next and what it means. But technology and all of that stuff, while it's a big part of our industry and it's driving a lot of the change, by no means is it the only story within our industry. In fact, I think there's another storyline, a bigger storyline, that I, I think is, is pretty exciting. And that storyline starts with you the creators of the experiences, those who are taking the entrepreneurial risks that make our industry possible. So uh, for example, for those of you who were here last year, you might remember James and Brett from Forged Axe Throwing from Whistler. James and Brett, are you guys here somewhere? Yeah. Well, so one thing about axe throwers, they seem fairly committed. Uh, but uh, there's, I mean, it was amazing when I, like, when I came here, I had never even heard of, of axe throwing until last year. And now it's like this global phenomenon. There are axe throwing experience centers all over the United States and in Europe, it's extraordinary. And there are so many ways in which our industry is creating entirely new experiences for, for travelers. For example, you can have experiences with alligators in the swamps of Louisiana. You can soar over extraordinary heights in Alaska. You can experience some of the most important historical monuments in our country. And you can do this in a variety of ways. You can do astronaut training. You can take motorcycle tours around Israel. Doobie, are you here? Doobie, let's hear it. Let's hear it. Make some noise. Come on. Doobie from Israel. OK, and then there's this. So I've heard of hiking tours. I've heard of yoga, theoretically. Um, but I've never heard of yoga hiking tours and experiences. Apparently, that is also a thing. Hi, Miranda. And then there's this. So 15 years ago, 
Who ever took a food tour, let alone uh, heard of food tours? I mean, it's just it's incredible. How many food tour operators do we have here? <laughs> All right. You guys are taking over the world. I love it. It's amazing. This is like, it's like the hottest thing in travel and tourism. And by the way, the research that we did last year, as you all know, when we travelers plan and think about their in-destination experience, what's number one? You got it. Food. Most important. So, so much of the story and what we're focused on is about kind of the commercial aspects. We all want to grow our business and make money, but there's so much more. There's a bigger potential impact of our industry. For example, a little bit later this morning on this stage, you're going to hear from the founder of Invisible Cities and the impact that they are having on homelessness in the cities where they run their tours. I promise you, this is a talk you will not want to miss. So let's go a little bit deeper into who's actually here. So we have just under 1,200 attendees, nearly 600 companies from 50 countries around the world. This is the most we've ever had. It's amazing to see you all here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and, and most of you are from the United States. Uh, however, nearly 30% are from overseas. Uh, for example, we have Harmeet Singh from Delhi Airport Service. Harmeet. Hi. Good Hi. morning. Good morning. So Delhi Airport Service, I'm, I'm presuming that is actually, the picture is not one of your airports. Yeah, no, that's not the airport. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's down south in Kerala in the backwaters. Uh, and yeah. that's, one of your, that's one of the tours that you do, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Now, Kerala is a, one of the most beautiful parts of... It is, it is. Right. Well, it's amazing to have you here. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you. So, most of the attendees here, most of the attending companies are operators. So this is the word that we use for those who create and deliver the tour, activity, attraction, or event, or experience. 70% of you are operators. However, we have a lot of distributors, more than 60 of those 120 companies I talked about earlier. Online travel agencies, multi-attraction pass providers, and other companies that resell tours, activities, and attractions uh, are here. We also have over 50 technology companies, those companies that are trying to automate and transform our industry as well. So this gives you kind of a sense of the statistics of our attendees, but I also like to highlight some of the individual stories just to give a sense of who's here. So for example, we have Sam Dinner from Taste Carolina. Sam, hey. welcome. Thank you. So I, I, I have a specific reason why I wanted to highlight you, because so I've been covering tech for many years, and so I've always aspired to be a CTO, and now I think I might finally be qualified. It's uh, great. So, so it's amazing. So what are you eating there? Uh, some fried chicken from Beasley's, which is a James Beard Award-winning restaurant in Raleigh, North Carolina. It looks, looks pretty good. And I also understand that you were a teacher before you started a food tour company. Yes, I taught third grade for five years. Wow, it's amazing. So I imagine there's a really interesting story about that transition, which I would love to hear about, and perhaps we can do that later. Sounds Thank great. You. Awesome. Thank you. Ladies, Sam Dinner. I know there's, there's two people that I, I want to ask you to stand up, uh, Natasia Miller and Anna Bancroft. Um, so I've asked you both. Uh, to stand up uh, because so you're both representing operators from the Bahamas. Of course, the Bahamas experienced something uh, really extraordinary with uh, Hurricane Dorian. Um, so first, we're just touched that you're here. It's really amazing. I'd love to just get a sense of how is the recovery going and what are some of the things that you're doing in the Bahamas uh, to help? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's great to be here. I think we both feel really fortunate to be here. And um, I represent, or I'm from, the island of New Providence, Nassau, which was spared the worst of the storm. Two of our islands, the Abacos and Grand Bahama, unfortunately were devastated. So being able to be in the capital and be able to provide immediate relief to our brothers and sisters that needed to be evacuated was important. Great. And Natasia. Yeah, so first of all, we just want to say that we are so grateful to the arrival community and you specifically and everybody that's given us this opportunity to speak about this. And for us, what we're doing for three ends, 
we are doing care packages for the people that have survived. Like she said, um, two islands were very difficult, having very difficult times. So we wanted to give back to those islands. And we have our motto for this program called um, sponsor, share, and send. So you can sponsor a care package, whether that's um, donating to an Amazon list or donating money, whichever is easiest for you. Sharing, as in sharing that the Bahamas is a place to go now. The best way to help the Bahamas is to send people, send your sister, brother, everyone, send an email out. Just tell people to have vacations there because we need you to keep our country afloat. We are still, you know, 698 islands that are very faring very well. And lastly is send. We are sending hope to these people with these little note cards. I brought some, so the 50 countries that are represented here, if you wanted to, just look for this little pig that's walking around and you can send a note to a family. We're gonna put it in the care packages so that they can know that people all over the world care for them. Thank right. you so much. The stage of Anna, thank you. So if you So stories like these, I think, are, are so important. I mean, not just, not just for our industry, for this world, but for the broader travel and tourism sector. You know, when we, when we ask travelers, you know, what matters most to you? Like when you think about your trip, when you're planning, when you're kind of dreaming, right? it's all of you. It's the tours, the activities, the attractions. It's not the flights, it's not the, the accommodation. I'm not saying those aren't important by any means. Those are the how. They make travel possible. That makes it happen. But all of you, you are the why. You are the reason people travel in the first place. So this is why we call all of you the best part of travel. Now, so it is the best part of travel, but we can do better. There's a lot of things that are going on. First, discovery. This is one of the biggest challenges confronting our industry. The internet, Google, OTAs, they've made it easier than ever for travelers to find you. And yet, it's not that easy. And I'm hearing more and more from you. It seems like it's getting harder. It certainly seems to be getting more expensive. This is why we devote so much of our program here to marketing and digital and education and partnerships and building distribution. Now, once you're found, you have to be bookable. And I hear and I see from you know, lots of operators, often they're not bookable. Or they're not bookable when their customers want to book. In research that we just did earlier this year with the National Council of Attractions and Experiences, part of US travel, we see tour takers. Three out of four, under the age of 35, booked their tour within seven days of taking the tour. And nearly half booked within two days. And how do you think they discovered those tours? Think it was like this? Or was it like this? I think we all know where the future is headed. Now, I do hear from operators well, my business, my tours, they're different, they're special, they're complex, it's not suitable for online or for mobile or for last minute. And that may definitely be true, absolutely, for certain businesses. However, I distinctly remember hearing similar refrains from airline executives and travel agency executives 25, 30 years ago, when this whole online travel thing was just getting started. I mean, imagine, imagine if, it was an airline today that was not online bookable. Would you trust that airline? You think maybe in the future, a traveler would trust a tour company if they couldn't book it online? Next big issue is data. You know, one of the big advantages that American Airlines got out of its investment in Sabre was this treasure trove of transactions and data about its customers. You know, what did they want? What would they book? When would they book? Which advertising worked? How much would they be willing to pay? This was incredibly powerful. It gave them a huge competitive advantage. But big data insights doesn't have to come from large data sets and reservation systems. It can come from all sorts of places. For example, 
airline executives who oversaw food and beverage operations in flight. They were known, after flights would end, they would go through the trash. Why? They want to find out what would their customers consume and what would they throw away. Uh, by the way, I, I couldn't find any photos of trash from airline cabins, so I just put some airline food up there. <laughs> Who's hungry? So one of the insights that American Airlines got from that effort, they decided to remove one olive from every single salad that they served. It saved the airline $40,000 a year. Companies that not only have their best data, but also have best practices on how to derive insights from that. Those are the companies that are driving our industry forward. And now there is also the experience itself. In that same research that we did, we asked tour takers, actually involved travelers, how satisfied with you, were you with your experience? And how many travelers do you think said they were very satisfied with their tour? A little more than half. It's not bad. But what's going on? Right, what are we missing? How can we design amazing experiences that don't just leave our customers satisfied, but leave them delighted? And we have sessions on this stage and workshops with the likes of Margaret Hitz and Kelsey Toner that are going to address just this very topic. And by the way, I know that you know, we at Arrival, we always talk about you know, how big this industry is and how it's growing and there's all this huge opportunity, and we definitely believe it. But just as a quick reality check, what percentage of travelers do not take tours? More than half. Why not? What's going on? What are we missing? I think that's an interesting question. I'll be spending some time looking at that and some research that we'll present on this stage on Thursday morning. But that question, you know, what are we missing, that's, that's a really interesting one for me. Uh, so if you think about the evolution of the Sabre system I was talking about earlier, from a reservation system to really what became a global distribution system, it's referred to as a GDS in the travel industry. This was so successful that it really began to take over other sectors of travel. It happened in hotels, it happened in car rental, and the impact was significant. Then, some executives in the world of ground transportation, especially for business travel, they said, oh, you know, we need to have something here. It's really hard for corporations and corporate travel agencies to find and kind of book and all of that. We need to have a GDS for ground transportation. And there were some companies that stepped in and did OK, but it never really took off the way it did in flights and other sectors of travel. Then, about 10 years ago, a few guys, they had this idea. Well, what if I had an app on my phone, just touched a button, and because of GPS, the car would come to me? Of course, I'm talking about the likes of ride-hailing services like Uber and Lyft. And you know, there's lots we could discuss about the specifics of those companies, for sure. But that fundamental innovation, so profound and so significant. And what's amazing to me is the guys who came up with it and delivered it, they weren't experts in travel or transportation. Why did we miss it? Why wasn't this started by travel industry executives. We were in our GDS, kind of in our industry expertise. So what were we, were we missing? What were those guys focusing on? They didn't have the knowledge or the expertise. They, they were focused on the customer experience. How could they make the customer experience better? So this is an interesting question, right? So how do we, as an industry, how do we as a bus tour operator, a kayak, how do we get out of our bus tour? How do we get out of our kayak, our museum, our aquarium, and think about the customer experience and truly innovate 
and create the things that our customers truly really want? How do we see those things that we're missing? So when I'm confronted by questions like that in my own business, I refer back to an experience I had in my own life that I'd like to take a moment and share with all of you. So this is the Quinby family. The Quimby in the middle, his name is JC. He was born with Down syndrome, which means he's born with special gifts, as well as with a profound love of dinosaurs, where we are, in fact, at the world's largest dinosaur attraction. Anyone know where this is? Drumheller, Canadians, that's right. It's an amazing town in the middle of the badlands of Alberta. You can actually walk up into the mouth of that dinosaur. So one evening, it's a few years ago, so JC and I were sitting down to practice piano. And he turns to me and he says, Dad, well, I have a girlfriend. And I said, sure. And then he said, Dad, how do you get a girlfriend? I'm like, all right, pianos hold off for a minute. OK, so, well, once you find a girl you like, ask her out on a date. Dad, what's a date? Well. A date is where you take the girl out and go do something. You could uh, go get some ice cream, go see a movie. And when I said that, his eyes just lit right up. He loves movies, just loves movies. He said, Dad, Dad, I know exactly what we're going to go do. We're going to go see Aliens versus Dinosaurs. So first of all, time out. I don't even know if there's a movie called Aliens versus Dinosaurs, right? But even if there is, you yeah, I mean, she may not want to see aliens or dinosaurs. You really should ask the girl. Now, <laughs> he did not like that response. He was sitting at the piano. He's like, you know, hunched over. He's thinking super hard. Then suddenly, like something happens, his, lie, his eyes just light right up again. He looks at me. He says, Dad, I know what we're going to do. We're going to go see girls versus dinosaurs. <laughs> now, just as an aside, I checked it, and there is a movie. Uh, it was made in Germany, and there's no way in hell he's ever going to see it. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> should I keep this up there for a few more seconds? Okay. It is good. So why am I telling this story? Because you know, in JC's naivete, I, there's actually something quite profound. Now, he's not thinking about the how. How do we get there? What's possible? He's already there. He sees what would make this better. He's got his solution. Of course, there should be this movie that would be great for him and for the girl. So now, here we are as we, all of us together, as we embark on this journey over the next three days, I encourage you to let go a little bit of what you know and all of your expertise and experience. I promise you that'll be waiting for you in the office as soon as you get back on Monday. Instead, let's start a conversation about what does better look like for our industry. You are surrounded by almost 1,200 of the most creative, committed, passionate, <laughs> inspired people within this industry who want to have this conversation with you. I believe that each of you, you're not just a food tour operator, a walking tour operator, a zip line operator, a museum, a, a zoo, or amusement park. You're not just a part of the third largest sector within travel. You're a part of something bigger. You are the why. You are the reason people travel in the first place. You are literally the stuff of dreams. You are the best part of travel. So let's make it better.